in the chapter, uh, in chapter 13, he also talks about some political philosophy of John Locke and Stuart Mill. These are both uh, libertarian philosophers, okay? And a lot of their ideas make it into South Park episodes when we're talking about uh, um, uh, voting and voting rights and what does a vote mean and douches and turds, all right? But Locke had, you know, basically, his philosophy was centered on the fact that people, all people, had certain inalienable rights, mostly to life, liberty, and freedom, okay? Uh, freedom of choice, okay? And this was a major part of his philosophy and many libertarian um, philosophers is that you have a freedom of choice, even if that, you know, choice has negative impacts for you personally, right? There's a major part. And he also had a main idea is that, and this is very simple, this is a basic idea, that political authority comes from the consent of the people. Okay? That authority isn't, um, that's imbued by us, you know, and when we don't agree with the candidates we have and the decisions that they make on our behalf, um, do they as candidates, do those political officials, do they still have authority? And that's something to always sort of think, out, think about. And, and his view was that that authority isn't by being elected president. <clears throat> it isn't by being elected this or that. It's by the confidence in the people um, in your ability to do what you're doing and how you do it. The consent of the people, of the majority. Which you don't necessarily get with an electoral college. Okay? Now, John Stuart Mill had a lot of the same types of ideas, but basically um, he thought often and talked about often the power of voting. And voting was, you know, for him, our main connection to political institutions and to politicians. It was our way, our way of, of aligning ourselves with the views and the behaviors and the habits and the ideas and the visions of political candidates, okay? And it's what gave them legitimization, right? Was our sort of connection or, you know, believing in, you know, we gave them the authority, kind of just like Locke said. Um, and one of the things, and this is an incredibly libertarian viewpoint, is that government should not um, interfere with the liberty of people unless um, the choices people were and are making have a negative social impact and harms other people. For instance, should the government be able to say you cannot smoke tobacco? Hmm. Okay. Uh, in certain places even, you know. Uh, well, that's an individual choice. My choice to smoke tobacco, which I don't, uh, has a negative impact on me, right? Does it, do people not like it when I smoke in public or if I smoked in public? They may not, but it doesn't harm them. Now, then you could think about that more and you could think about, well, people who smoke have, you know, health problems. It's just inevitable you're going to have health problems if you're a lifelong smoker. And how does that impact the med medical system? How does that impact society maybe negatively over time? So maybe not in the moment is there um, harm to others, uh, but, you know, maybe there can be larger, you know, down the road, you know, uh, social harms. You know, libertarian philosophers or libertarian theories of, like, drug use. How does uh, smoking, you know, marijuana negatively impact society? Or should that be an individual's choice? Alcohol, you know, all, all that stuff. So um, the, the idea here is really, you know, like, you know, we should be able to have the right to choose, um, you know, and only have liberties taken away from us if it harms others. Guns. That would be another one, you know, to, you know, what would John Stuart Mill say about, you know, guns in the United States? You know, a lot of people, you know, would say, well, you know, like the government should interfere with this and not make it so easy to get a goddamn, you know, automatic rifle, you know, um, because, yeah, like people, the small, 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 small percentage of gun owners, you know, have used those to harm other people, um, but, like, does that mean that that should be taken away from the millions of, of, of responsible gun owners? Um, and that's, that's where, you know, we start talking about, you know, politics and we start talking about some of these things. But, he, you know, the question comes out of both of their philosophies, you know, 
why do we vote? Is it civic duty? Do we feel like it, it's what makes us a citizen versus just a, a person, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, in society? Does it make us a citizen? Is it our civic duty to do this? Or do we vote because of social pressure, because our mom says we need to, because uh, the media says we need to, because our douchebag professors tell us we need to vote even though we're voting between a douche and a turd sandwich and we believe there's a better choice out there, um, you know, and that if we vote for, um, if we choose not to vote, we're in fact voting in a turd sandwich. Um, you know, what does the media tell us, etc. You know, it, is that why we vote? You know, is it, is it because we feel invested in it or is it because society pressures us into doing it? Again, douche and turd in this episode reflects like this idea of like the two-party system of false choice, of limited choices, or the fact that we don't actually have a choice. We have two unsavory choices, okay? Um, but there's other parties. There's the Green Party, the Libertarian par Party, the Natural Law Party, the Constitution Party. There's like other parties, but you don't ever really get to hear from them. And in pre presidential um, elections, you know, you have in 1987, the uh, Democratic and Republican parties set up the Commission of Presidential Debates. These are the nationally televised debates that you see um, in, in fall, and you're going to see this year. Um, which is going to be fucking interesting. Um, now, to get on, on these debates as a third party, as another party, you have to, in the previous election, the previous four, the, like, four years before, your party has to obtain 15% um, of the vote. Okay? Now, you've had a few times, Ross Perot... Um, you had uh, Ralph Nader almost get there in the Green Party, but you, you very rarely have a third voice on stage because think, you know, these two, let's just call them corporations, control the two voices that, that you hear. There's no alternative um, on the debates, you know, and we see, we see this um, in, in this, the, the, the satire on those debates in Douche and Turd, okay? Um, and I think the important thing is we have to think about, like, you know, the question here is voting a form of self-expression. That's, or is it not? And that's where one of the challenges comes in when you, when you vote. Because, yeah, is voting a form of self-expression? Then you vote for a candidate that expresses your views or as close to your views as possible. But what happens when it is, from your perspective, a douche or a turd? What happens when voting ceases to become something you're connected to, ceases to become a part of you? Hmm, okay. They talk a little bit in the chapter about a pro proportional representation system. So, um, you know, the, the pers you know, which is not what we have, but they have this type of government in many de democratic countries where the percentage uh, of a vote in a national election that a party gets is the percentage of seats that they have um, in legislature or parliament or whatever or whatever it is. So if the Green Party got 10% of the votes um, this fall, they would have 10% of the legislature, you know, Congress or Senate or whatever, uh, versus like not much, <laughs> not nothing, right? Like, um, you know, uh, so, I mean, that's one of the ways where, you know, maybe our system is also flawed, where we, we don't have a proportional representation system, where you have an unproportional uh, representation system. I mean, you have countries like Sweden where the fucking pirate party uh, has a couple percent, you know, there, you know. So it's, it's very, very different. All we have is the winner takes all, which is this extremist two-party system. And that's what happens Ultimately, why you, when you look at the United States, you look at it as an extreme sort of thing. You have one or the other. You don't have another, you know, and that's a very important part. And that's one of the things that South Park likes to sort of draw on and attack and critique in its political commentary. So we're going to take a little break. Uh, we'll come back, talk about Chapter 11, and move on to about last night and some member berries. <laughs> 